I thank members for their questions and suggestions, and I will start on how we can build a Singapore where families and seniors can flourish. Strong families are the building blocks for an ecosystem of care within our communities. They help to ensure the health of our children and are pivotal to supporting our seniors to age well. Aging well starts from home, and families should always be the first bastion of care. Studies show that most seniors prefer to age in the community, close to their families and friends. Likewise, many families have a desire to care for their loved ones at home. To support these aspirations, the government will dedicate at least $3.5 billion over the next decade to support the implementation of HWL SG, of which $1.9 billion will be dedicated to MOH's initiatives. HWL SG is led by MOH, MND, MOT, with other partner agencies like PA, MSF, and other volunteer organizations to enable seniors to lead vibrant and fulfilling lives in the community with their families. The whole village will work together to realize the HUL SG plans. First, we will invest in active aging centers, which should be a key enabler for seniors to age well within the community. Ultimately, we want seniors to be engaged and connected with their friends and families, which is key to keeping healthy, and we would like to make it easier for seniors and families to access available care services and resources in the community. The AACs are expanding the quality and range of their programs and adapting their offerings to suit the preferences of seniors living in the vicinity to make it easier for seniors to join in. Most AACs also extend these programs at community places, spaces like PA's Residence Network. I'm told that seniors can participate in classes and activities, and there are also programs which have been proven to help seniors to age well physically and cognitively. Take learning as an example. The National Silver Academy, NSA, offers a diverse range of courses at about 60 AACs, ranging from topics like health and wellness, financial literacy, to IT and science. There are also courses for seniors to pick up practical skills, like taking professional photos or floral arrangements. Most of these courses held at the AACs are affordable, and around three quarters of them are eligible for skills future credits. Mr. Yip Hong Wing asked about our plans for the rollout of AACs, our outreach efforts, especially for those who might be socially isolated and how our initiatives can help to foster intergenerational bonding. I will address these points below. We are scaling up our network of AACs. Since the implementation of the AAC service, we have grown to 157 AAC centres and have seen a steady increase in senior engaged yearly, from 17,000 in 2021 to more than 49,000 seniors in 2022. We will do more and expand the network of AACs to 220 by end 2025. This means that by 2025, 8 in 10 seniors will have access to AAC activities near their homes. AACs serve all seniors regardless of housing type. Therefore, if you have seniors among your loved ones, especially those living on their own, please encourage them to join a nearby AAC. Secondly, under h well, we envision all seniors to be supported within the community regardless whether they live alone or with family. This is where the community is key. We have started this community effort. Together with volunteer ambassadors, the Civil Generation Office has engaged more than 330,000 seniors in the past four years through house visits, including those who live alone or may have no family. They help to connect the seniors to community events or activities organized by AACs 
such as communal dining. As such, in addition to participating in activities at the AACs, we also hope for our seniors to join in our efforts in reaching out to other seniors in the community, together with their families and friends. Let me share about Madam Yuling Xia. For about eight years now, Madam Xia has been actively reaching out to fellow seniors in the community through home visits and telephone engagements. Madam Xia says that she finds it especially meaningful when she has good conversations with the people she outreaches to who have now become her friends. And Madam Xia is 72 years old. Her spirit has caught on and how and now her daughter, granddaughter and son-in-law also joined in. We are happy that Madam Xia is finding such meaning in her senior years and their volunteering has fostered and strengthened intergenerational bonds across the family. Ultimately, we want our communities to be places where seniors gather with friends, keep active and stay healthy, starting with active ageing centres. Thirdly, we will enable seniors to be active and move around their neighbours, neighbourhoods with ease. We will enhance our infrastructure. MND and MOT will be making our flats, neighbourhoods and streets more senior-friendly through East 2.0. The upgrading of selected older precincts and MOT's Friendly Streets Initiative. I'm sure members have seen how silver zones and the leaves at pedestrian overhead bridges bring much joy to our seniors. We will also make enhancements to the home environment. Dr Tan Wu Ming and Mr Yip Hon Wing would be happy to note that in-flat detectors will be introduced as part of East 2.0 to provide a peace of mind for families with seniors. Mr Chairman, while we want seniors to be able to age in the community with their families and friends, we recognise that families caring for seniors with care needs, with care needs may face additional stresses. Therefore, we will do more to support these families in caring for their loved ones. We have increased access to home medical care and improved affordability. Today, the government provides up to 80% means-tested subsidies to patients for home care services such as home medical, home nursing, and home therapy. Since October 2023, MediSafe 500, 700, and Flexi MediSafe schemes have been extended to homebound patients receiving home medical care from MOH-funded providers. Dr Tan Wu Ming and Ms Mariam Jaffa asked about allaying costs beyond medical expenses. MOH's primary focus is to ensure healthcare services are affordable for all. Our mainstream financing, S plus 3M's framework, is thus focused on covering acute care, primary care, as well as long-term care services. Nevertheless, we recognise that there are ancillary costs associated with caregiving and that health and social care are closely related. Hence, MOH has targeted grant schemes to better support families to defray other caregiving expenses, especially for the lower income. This includes the medical escort and transport or MET services to help frail seniors attend medical appointments or travel to senior care centres, the Home Caregiving Grant and Seniors Mobility and Enabling Fund. We will continue to monitor and review. We try to help, but there is a limit to how much we can cover. Expanding scope of financing would further push up national health care expenditure and ultimately would result in a greater burden to our people. To better support families and caregivers within the community, we will improve existing services and pilot new care models, as Dr Tan Wu Ming, Mr Yip Hong Wing and Mr Henry Quek have suggested. We are studying more options for home care via an ongoing pilot. Under HPC+, seniors are assisted in their daily activities 
and this also includes housekeeping services. As of January 2024, there are 328 clients enrolled under the HPC Plus pilot. We will evaluate the pilot by end 2024 before determining whether to expand it nationwide. We thank Mr. Henry Quack for his query on the stay-in shed caregiving sandbox, which was launched to mitigate the impact of shrinking family sizes on family caregiving. Under this sandbox, a shared caregiver assists a group of seniors living in public or pub private estates with the activities of daily living. This sandbox will be in place for at least a year until first quarter 2025. MOH will review its outcomes and take Mr. Henry Quack's feedback into consideration when determining next steps, which we will announce when finalised. MOH will also introduce standardised care assessments and progressively appoint bundled services providers so that seniors can enjoy more seamless care delivery. This reduces the need for multiple assessments and unnecessary referrals by different care providers. For seniors who require further care in nursing homes, the median wait time for nursing home placement is around one month. In the interim, AIC works closely with the seniors and their caregivers to make alternative interim care arrangements as needed. These efforts will go some way to support families and caregivers. We want to make it easier for them to manage the cognitive and physical load of providing care for their loved ones at home. This includes senior caregivers who may be caring for senior family members. In addition, we will provide caregivers with resources so that they can be supported in caring for their loved ones. Since November 2023, caregivers have also been able to use their Skills Future Credits for eligible caregiver training courses. This year, we'll be enhancing the caregiver's training grant from the current $200 per year to up to $400 per year per care recipient. To subsidize the cost of caregiving training, conducted by approved training providers. With these schemes, caregivers can receive more affordable and accessible caregiver training to help them care for their loved ones in the community. I would like to assure Ms. Kerry Tan that support for caregivers can be found in the community. Today, caregivers can access the AIC hotline and online resources available on AIC's website as well as Care Services Recommender on the Support Go Where portal. We will also progressively level up all AACs as community touchpoints to provide information and referral services. For example, families and caregivers can visit an AAC to discuss how they can obtain the appropriate care for their seniors. There are also nine AIC links located in public hospitals to provide caregivers who are planning for the discharge of their loved ones from the hospital. AIC also runs crests and commit teams that provide support for seniors and caregivers with mental health needs. For social emotional support, caregivers can also tap on the Caregiver Support Network, CSNs, and win Caregivers Network by PA. Chairman, we have an ambitious vision to be a society where we age well. We are rolling out plans in a community that enable seniors to live active lives. We are investing in infrastructure across neighbourhoods. We are supporting families in caring for their loved ones. But ultimately, it's about the heart where each of us looking out for one another, helping our seniors lead vibrant and fulfilling lives in the community. Even as we are investing in more support for our seniors, we are also enhancing support for our young families to have healthy and happy lives. In 2021, we set up the Task Force on Child and Maternal Health and Wellbeing, or CAMH in short, comprising an interdisciplinary team of policymakers and practitioners from across the health, social, and education domains. The Task Force came together to explore how children and their families can attain good health and well-being. I thank the Task Force members for their hard work over the past three years. 
They engage parents and caregivers, brainstorm with partners, and develop sound recommendations, relying on evidence-based research such as growing up in Singapore towards healthy outcomes or GASTO study, we were able to formulate ways to improve the health of our children and families. I'm glad to announce that the task force has completed the development of the CAMH strategy and action plan. Recommendations under the strategy have been translated into 48 initiatives under the action plan. Currently, 28 out of the 48 initiatives have been or are being implemented, while the remainder are under review in preparation for launch. A detailed report will be shared later this year. Let me now speak on two recommendations that exemplify our commitment to strengthen support for children and their families. One of these recommendations is to enhance support for couples from preconception and pregnancy through to parenthood. Many parents to be recognised that antenatal care is important as they prepare for the birth of their child. However, not all parents have access to resources and support. Therefore, we have looked into increasing access to antenatal care, and I'm pleased to share that we'll be piloting antenatal education classes for parents within the community. Those who attend these classes will have convenient access to subsidised antenatal support close to their homes. Couples can look forward to learning about nutrition and exercises during pregnancy and after delivery, and be equipped to care for their newborn. The classes will be conducted via hybrid model, incorporating online lectures and videos so that parents can easily access these useful resources virtually. It's important that we support and celebrate active fathering too. In collaboration with the Families for Life Council and Centre for Fathering, we are strengthening the participation of fathers in parent support groups in schools. This will provide more avenues for fathers to share and learn valuable parenting insights and tips. We'll continue to support fathers who may require more support in their parenthood journey. At COS last year, I shared how the NUH expanded the Women's Emotional Health Service Plus, or WEH S Plus pilot, extending mental health support services to fathers in need. This support is important at the antenatal and postnatal stages, as they take on a new role of a father. This pilot has also since extended support for mothers up to six years postnatal, up from the previous one year. We want couples to feel supported and assured during their parenthood journey, even and especially when they meet challenges. Let me share how Ms. S and her husband benefited from the program. As Ms. S experienced postnatal depression and anxiety, the team followed up with regular check-ins and emotional support to ensure she was coping well. The team also ensured that her husband received timely assistance and treatment. Both are faring better now. And the good news is Ms. S is expecting another baby. I'm glad that this program has given them the confidence and reassurance that they are well supported in their journey. Over time, Ms. S and her husband will be able to transit to Family Nexus, which supports families with children aged 0 to 6, enabling them to access cross-domain services at a one-stop community touchpoint near their homes. Last year, I announced the launch of the Family Nexus pilot at our Tampines Hub. I'm delighted to update that the Family Nexus pilot has been rolled out to three more sites in Singapore at Chua Chukang, Pongol, and Sembawang Polyclinics to extend support to more families. Helping our children pick up good habits for good health during their formative years paves the way for better long health, long-term health. Therefore, we want to empower parents with more resources and information to nurture healthy habits in their children. This, too, is one of the task force recommendations. During our engagement, many parents shared that they were on the lookout for accessible and reliable information to support them in nurturing their children. 
We shared about Parent Hub in 2022, a one-stop resource portal to provide timely information on pregnancy and parenting to families. Since its launch, Parent Hub has garnered over 3 million views, with over 100,000 page views monthly. We continue to expand on these resources, such as by making new interactive evidence-based resources on nurturing healthy eating in childhood and other relevant topics available on the portal. To better support individuals in nurturing healthy eating habits in children from young, I'm happy to share that KK Women's and Children's Hospital and the College of Pediatrics and Child Health Singapore launched the Singapore Guidelines for Feeding and Eating in Infants and Young Children last month. These guidelines support those involved in the care of children aged 0 to 2 in nurturing healthy eating habits, providing goals and milestones in the transition from infant feeding to eating as a young child. I urge parents, caregivers and healthcare professionals to refer to these guidelines to promote a positive environment for the adoption of healthier eating habits in our young children, which would be beneficial to them in years to come. We will make resources available beyond the early years. Students will be able to access online interactive resources through MOE's Student Learning Space this year. These resources will help students learn more about healthier eating habits and ways to have a balanced meal. These efforts are aligned with the Gasto Richard study, which shows that the children's eating behaviours, such as portion size, food choice and nutrition, are key risk factors for childhood obesity. Allow me to summarise in Malay. Kementerian Kesihatan telah membangun rancangan untuk strategi dan tindakan bagi kesihatan dan kesejahteraan golongan lanjut isya serta kanak-kanak dan ibu. Kami telah menyelesaikan pembangunan CAMH yang memberi tumpuan kepada pelbagai peringkat dari prenatal hingga remaja, membangunkan inisiatif untuk menyokong kanak-kanak dan keluarga dalam bidang seperti penjagaan perinatal, sokongan ibu bapa dan tabiat pemakanan yang sihat. Inisiatif inisiatif ini akan memberi kuasa dan menyokong keluarga kita dalam menjaga golongan lanjut usia dan kanak-kanak kita. Mr. Chairman, in closing, families are fundamental to enabling our seniors age well and to fostering a nurturing environment for our children to grow <coughs> learn and thrive. We'll continue to strengthen support for families. Together, we can build a society where every family is empowered to grow and age well and enjoy a life of health and well-being. Thank you.